is called Calvary, and that person is called Jesus. Well, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. You see, I can preach other than in the gospel of Luke. Every sermon I've preached thus far in the revival has been in the Gospel of Luke, but tonight we're going to look at Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. If you have found it, say amen. Amen. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. I've been preaching now for 54 years. And I think in all of these years of preaching, the question that I have been asked more than any other is this one. Brother Bob, why did God create the devil? Brother Bob, why did God create the devil? When you think of all the havoc that the devil has caused on this planet, All the murders and rapes and thefts, all of the sexual immorality, all of the broken homes, all of the wars, all of the child molestation. I mean, all of that, every bit of it, you can lay it at the feet of the devil. Why did God create the devil? Well, I want us to settle that tonight once and for all. Are you ready? God did not create the devil. The devil. God did not create the devil. God created an angel by the name of Lucifer. And Lucifer made himself into the devil. When you think about what the Bible teaches about Lucifer, it's very interesting. First of all, the Bible teaches that Lucifer was one of the most prominent angels that God ever made. I don't know how many angels there are, but the New Testament says there are myriads upon myriads. That means ten thousands upon ten thousands. And that gets up into the billions. And so there are billions of angels that God made. But only three of them are identified by name in the Bible. Out of all of the billions of angels that God made, only three are identified by name. There is Michael, there is Gabriel, and there is Lucifer. And so by virtue of the fact that he is one of only three angels mentioned by name, I tell you, he was one of the most prominent angels God ever made. Take a second thing about it. According to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28, he was the most beautiful angel God ever made. You know, sometimes people think that all angels look alike, but they don't. 
All people don't look alike, and aren't you glad for that? I spend a whole lot of time in my second home, which is in the Atlanta airport. I mean, I'm there hours and hours and hours every single month. And I just sit there, and I've learned to enjoy watching people go by. And I've learned this. God did not make everybody a 10, all right? God made a lot of twos and three and a halves. I promise you he did. And so all people don't look alike and all angels don't look alike, but Lucifer was the most beautiful angel that God ever made. But also he seems to be the most talented angel God made. According to Ezekiel 28, it speaks of his pipes and his tablets, which speaks of his ability to sing. Lucifer was a singing angel. Sometimes we speak of someone who can sing well, and we say, man, they could sing the stars down. Well, I want to tell you, Lucifer could sing the stars up. He was the best singer in all of heaven. And so he was a prominent angel, he was a beautiful angel, and he was a, he was a, a very talented angel. But he, that did not satisfy him. He wanted more. He wanted more. And we find out exactly how the devil came into existence when we read the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 12 and following, Lucifer became the devil when he put two words together, just two little words. And those two little words were, I will. I will. When you read those verses there in Isaiah 14, he says, I will five times. And here's basically what he said. He said, I will have God's place. I will have God's power. I will have God's people. I will have God's position. And then he said, I will have God's person. He said, I will be the most high God. Now you talk about arrogance. You talk about conceitedness. There's not any being God ever made more arrogant or conceited than the angel of Lucifer. The idea that he, a created being, thinks he can have God's person. To think he can become God. And that's when Lucifer, the angel, became the devil. Now I want to share with you from the verses that I read for you tonight four things about the devil and then we'll have our prayer. This won't be a long sermon, but I want you to listen very carefully because these answer some questions that you may have about the devil. First of all, I want you to see that the Bible teaches here that the devil is a loser. Now look what it says there in verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Now that's sort of foreign to us, isn't it? If it had said there was war in China or war in Afghanistan or war in Pakistan or war in Korea or even war in America, we might understand that. But it says there was war in heaven. We don't expect that. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. The dragon, which is another term for the devil, he and his angels fought against Michael and his angels, and the devil and his angels prevailed not. Now, folks, if you don't prevail, that means you're a loser. And so I want you to say it out loud right now with me. Satan is a loser. Say that. Satan is a loser. He's a loser. First of all, he lost the war. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. The devil and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. Satan lost the war. But I want you to see something else he lost. Not only did he lose the war, he lost the privilege for living in heaven. The Bible says, and there was found no more place for them. They got kicked out of heaven. Now, folks, listen to me. If you get kicked out of heaven, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. Now, some of you boys and girls, your mother and dad may tell you don't use that word stupid, and you obey your mother. My mother's dead, so it doesn't matter. But I'm telling you, it's a pretty dumb thing to get kicked out of heaven. Amen? I mean, Satan and all of these angels, they lived in heaven, but they were cast out. One of the most unusual things the Bible teaches, and I cannot explain it, 
I have no idea why it happened, but the Bible teaches that when the devil rebelled against God, that one-third of all of the angels God made sided with the devil. I don't know why. I don't know how that happened. But one-third of the angels in heaven sided with Lucifer in his rebellion against God. And so when God cast Lucifer out, he also cast those angels out, and that's who demons are. Last night we talked a little bit about demons, and demons are simply those angels that were cast out of heaven when God cast Lucifer out of heaven because of his rebellion. But I want you to see not only that he lost the war, and not only did he lose the privilege of living in heaven, he also lost his good name. He lost his good name. Lucifer is not a bad name. As a matter of fact, it's a very beautiful name. I told you there were three angels mentioned by name. Michael, the word Michael means who is like God. Gabriel, the word Gabriel means strong man of God. And then Lucifer means bright morning star. Now all three of those names of those three angels speak of the person of Jesus Christ. Michael, who is like God? I'll tell you who's like God. Jesus is like God because Jesus is God. Gabriel, strong man of God. Who is the strong man of God? I'll tell you who the strong man of God is. Jesus, he's the strong man of God. Lucifer, bright morning star. Who is the bright and morning star? I'll tell you who he is. He is Jesus the Son of God. And so the name Lucifer was a wonderful name. It was a beautiful name, but you never find this being. You never find Lucifer after God cast him out of heaven. He is never again in the Bible ever called Lucifer. He's never referred to that name again. In the Gospels, he's called Beelzebub. Beelzebub means the prince of demons. In 2 Corinthians, he's called Belial, which means the worthless one, the one who has no value. In the book of Revelation chapter 9, he's called by the Hebrew word Abaddon and by the Greek word Apollyon, and both of those names mean the destroyer. And that's what the devil is. He's a destroyer. He will destroy your home. He will destroy your character. He will destroy your dreams. He will destroy your hopes. He will destroy every plan you've ever made. He will destroy your life. The devil is a destroyer. Also, he is called in the New Testament the devil, Satan, the dragon, and the old serpent. But he's never, not one time in the New Testament, he's never called Lucifer. He lost his good name. But not only did he lose his good name, he ruined his good name. I've known a lot of people who named their children, their sons Michael. I've known a lot of people who named girls and boys Gabriel. But I have never known anyone who named their child Lucifer. You see, he polluted that good name, and he lost it and ruined it for everybody else. And so the devil is a loser. And now you hear me. If you side with him, you're going to be a loser too. If you end up rejecting Jesus and you die without Christ, and you have sided yourself with the devil. And hey, if you're not for Jesus, you're against him. You're either a child of God or you're a child of the devil. That's what the Bible teaches. And if you come to the end of life and you die as one of the, one of the offspring of the devil, then you too will be a loser for eternity. You will be a loser for eternity. But I want you to see a second thing. Not only is the devil, Satan, a loser, he is also a deceiver. Now look in verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. 
which deceiveth the whole world. The devil is not only a loser, the devil is a deceiver, and it says he is a deceiver of the whole world. He devised a strategy for the people of the world, and his strategy is to deceive them. And I tell you, we live in a world today full of deceived people. Now, I could preach for hours on the deceptiveness of the devil, but I'm not going to do that. Amen. But I want to share with you three little areas in which the devil has deceived most of the people of this world. First of all, he has deceived people concerning the seriousness of sin. Nobody takes sin very seriously anymore. And if a preacher were to dare to preach against sin, why he's called an old fuddy-duddy, an antiquated person, he's not relevant, he's a bigot, he's a man of hate. Oh, so many, many vile names. But I'm telling you, God has never changed his mind about sin. And just because people don't take sin very seriously anymore, I promise you the devil takes sin, uh, God takes sin very seriously. The devil has deceived people concerning the seriousness of sin. Also, the devil has concerned people concerning the way to heaven. Folks, there are not five ways to heaven. There are not three ways to heaven. There are not even two ways to heaven. There's only one way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. You cannot go to heaven through Buddha. You cannot go through heaven to heaven through Muhammad. You cannot go to heaven through Mahatma Gandhi. You can only go to heaven through Jesus Christ. You can go to heaven without any money. You can go to heaven without good health. You can go to heaven without any friends. But you cannot go to heaven without Jesus Christ. He's not just a way to heaven. He's not even the best way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. But the devil has deceived the people of the world. Do you know we have now over 7 billion people on planet earth? Over 7 billion people live on this planet. Only one and a half billion even profess to be Christians. Out of seven billion people, only one and a half even claim to be Christian. And many of those folks are not really saved because it would include the cults like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and others. But folks, I want to tell you, the devil has deceived the people of the world concerning the way to heaven. You see, there are at least five and a half billion people on planet earth who think they're going to heaven without Jesus Christ. I tell you, the devil has done a pretty good job deceiving the people of the world. But not only has he deceived people concerning the seriousness of sin and the way to heaven, but also the time of salvation. You know, there are a lot of people who believe, well, preacher, I know I need to be saved. And preacher, one day I plan to get saved, but I'm not ready now, preacher. I got to sow my wild oats. I got places to go, people to see, things to do. And one day when I get old and dilapidated and worn out, well, then I'll get saved. It doesn't work like that, beloved. You just can't get saved any time you get ready to get saved. You can only be saved while God is ready to save you. And you can wait too long. You really can. You can cross a line. There, there's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord where the call of His Spirit is lost. Even now it may be that the line you've crossed, have you counted, have you counted the cost? And yet many, many people believe they can just be saved any time. Now, God will give you a window of opportunity, but you can stay at the fair too long. You can say no one time too many, and your opportunity will be gone forever. That's why it's so important. If God speaks to you tonight, you ought to come be saved tonight because God may never speak to you again. He, he just may never speak to you again. And so the devil is a loser, and the devil is a deceiver. But I want you to see a third thing. The devil, Satan, is an accuser. Say that with me. Satan is an accuser. Look in verse 10. 
And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. Now notice this. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down. The accuser of our brethren is cast down. Now there in verse 9 it says, He deceives the whole world. Satan's strategy for the people of the world, Satan's strategy for lost people is to deceive them. But Satan also has a strategy for saved people, for those who are part of the brethren and those who are Christians, and his strategy for Christians is to accuse them. That word accuse means to slander. It means to malign the character. Every time you try to pray, there the devil is whispering in your ear. Who do you think you are to talk to God? Every time you try to share the gospel and win somebody to faith in Christ, the devil is there saying, who do you think you are trying to tell somebody else how to live? You see, he slanders and maligns and accuses the people of God. You remember the book of Job? The book of Job is the oldest book of the Bible. Did you know that? I don't know of any Old Testament scholar that would question that. The first book of the Bible ever written was the book of Job. And in the beginning of the book of Job, there's a very interesting setting. The Bible says that God summons all of the spirit beings that he ever made to come into his presence. The book of Job calls them the sons of God, but it's not talking about humans. It's talking about all the spirits, that, all the spirit beings that God ever made. That would include all the angels. It would also include the demons, and it would include the devil. But in the book of Job, God summons them all to come into his presence. And so here they come. And when the devil gets back into the presence of God, he begins to do what he always has done. He begins to slander and malign and accuse the people of God. And the Bible says God hears him. And God says, Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect. He's upright. He escheweth evil, and he fears God. And the devil says, now God, don't you know the only reason Job cares anything about you is because of all the stuff you've let him have. He, Job, Job was one of the richest men on the planet. The Bible says he was the greatest of all the men in the East. He was one of the wealthiest men on planet Earth. He would be like the Bill Gates of our day. Job was a very wealthy man. But the devil says, Lord, if you'll let me take all the stuff that Job has away from him, Job will curse you. God said, all right. You can take everything he has, but don't touch him. You can't take his life. You can't take his health, but you can take everything else he's got, and the devil does. He takes his home. He takes his lands. He takes his livestock. He, he even takes the lives of his ten children. Job had seven sons and three daughters, and the wind came out of nowhere, hit the house. The house fell down on top of them, and all ten of them were killed immediately. So Job lost everything. And hey, that didn't happen over a period of years or months or weeks or days. Every bit of that happened in one morning. Job came out of his home. The sun was shining. God was in his heaven. Everything looked bright and cheerful. And all of a sudden, here comes a runner. Job, I've got bad news. These folks came and they've stolen away this part of your livestock. And the Bible says while he was yet speaking, here comes another. Job, I've got bad news. This has been taken from you. And while he was yet speaking, the Bible says, here comes another. Job, I've got bad news. And while he was yet speaking, here comes another. Job, I've got tragic news. Your ten children have all been killed instantly. Folks, he lost everything, every, the devil took everything he had in one morning. <clears throat> and the devil said, God, you let me take all this, God, and Job will curse you. And God said, take it. And the devil did. He took it all. And the Bible says after the devil took everything Job had, the Bible says, and Job worshiped God. You see, the devil's a liar. He's just a liar. Job worshiped God. Well, then God calls all of those spirit beings back again. I don't know how. I don't know why. I don't know where. But he calls all of those spirit beings to come back into his presence. And here come all the angels. Here come the demons. And here comes the devil again. 
into the presence of God. And again, he does what he always does. He began to slander the people of God. And God said, hey, Satan, have, have you considered my servant Job? He's perfect. He's upright. He assureth evil, and he fears God. And the devil can't say this time, well, Lord, if you'll let me take everything he's got, he'll curse you. No, he'd already done that. He said, well, Lord, I tell you, if you'll let me take his health away, the only reason Job cares anything about you is because you let him be healthy all his life. Why, he's never been sick, never had a cold, never had a flu, never been to a doctor. You let me take his health away, and Job will curse you. And God said, all right, you can take his health. You can't kill him, but you can take his health. And the devil does. Job becomes afflicted with one of the most awful diseases known to mankind. The Old Testament says he was covered from head to foot with balls, which is really just a symptom, most Old Testament scholars believe, of another illness. Most believe that he was afflicted with the form of leprosy called elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is a horrible, horrible disease that attacks the human body and twists it and deforms it and maligns the shape of it and it, you, you become unrecognizable. The skin becomes thick and bulky and your bones become twisted and gnarled and, and there's a horrible itch associated with that disease and that's what happens to Job. That's why he goes out to, according to the book of Job. He goes to the garbage dump every day picking up pieces of broken pottery and he picks up that broken pottery and uses it to try to scratch himself to get some relief from that awful, awful illness. And yet even after that the Bible says and Job worshipped God. Brother Bob do I have any defense? Am I just a victim? Am I just floating along like a piece of flox, flotsam? Am I just a, a victim of fickle faith? Do I have any defense? If the devil slanders me and maligns me and accuses me, do I have any defense? Oh, yes. The Bible says in verse 11, and they overcame him. Did you know you can overcome the devil? I meet a lot of people and they say, Brother Bob, I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances. Hey, who told you you have to live under the circumstances? Amen. You can live on top of the circumstances. We are not defenseless in spiritual warfare. We have a method of victory. He says they overcame him, first of all, by the blood of the Lamb. You know what that means? It means there's salvation. Hey, hey, if you're saved tonight, you're not saved because you're warm and cute and fuzzy and cuddly. If you're saved, you're saved because the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away all of your sin. And so when the devil accuses, when the devil slanders, when the devil maligns you, all you have to do is remind the devil you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. You don't belong to him. He has no right to your life. He has no authority over you. You're a blood-washed, spirit-filled child of the living God. You're no longer a part of his family. You're a part of God's family. They overcame him by their salvation. Secondly, they overcame him by the word of their testimony. Now, I used to think that referred to the giving of a personal testimony. And I do like to hear people give their testimony. Most of the times, I heard about that lady that stood up and gave her testimony. And she said, now, while I'm up, I want to give my husband's too. I give it better than he does. <laughs> when I was a boy growing up in church in Florence, Alabama, from time to time, our pastor would call for testimonies, and there was always one old lady. And I don't know, she must have been 175, I don't know, but she was, she was pretty old. And every time he would call for testimonies, Mrs. Hester, that was her name, she would always grab the pew in front of her, and she'd kind of unwind on the way up, you know. And she'd lift that little, I remember this as vivid as it was yesterday, and it's been over... 60 years ago, and she would raise that little hand, and she'd say, oh, oh, oh Brother Kelly, Pastor, oh, oh Pastor, oh, oh, I just want to stand and tell what the Lord has done for me. Now, I was just a kid, and I didn't know what the Lord had done to her, but I didn't want the Lord to do that to me. I mean, I'm being honest. I thought the Lord about ruined that old gal. 
But when it says they overcame him by the word of their testimony, it does not mean the giving of a personal testimony. It's referring to the scripture. This is the word of our testimony. If our testimony is not rooted and grounded on this book, it's meaningless. You remember the gospel say that early on in the gospels that Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And the devil tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread and he tempted Jesus to jump off the pinnacle of the temple and he tempted Jesus to bow down and worship him. The devil tempted him. But on every occasion when the devil tempted Jesus, Jesus responded, it is written, it is written, it is written. Folks, we can overcome the devil through the scripture. There's power in the word of God. They overcame him by their salvation, by their scripture. But then it says this, and they love not their lives unto the death. That means they overcame him by total surrender to Jesus Christ. What's the worst thing the devil can do to you? Well, the worst thing the devil can do to you is to take your life. The worst thing he can do to you is to kill you. But if he does, if you're a child of God, you're just going to heaven anyway. Amen? You can't lose as a child of God. And so if your life is surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and you are surrendered to the scriptures, the word of God, and you have surrendered your life to Christ and been saved by the blood of Jesus, I'm telling you, you have total authority over the devil. And there's not anything he can say that can defeat you if you'll just claim what you already have in Jesus Christ. The devil is a loser. The devil is a deceiver. The devil is an accuser, but he can be overcome. One last thing, and we'll be through. The devil is a short timer. The devil is a short timer. Look there with me, if you will, in verse 12. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. Why? Because the devil's gone. Woe unto you, inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Why? Because the devil's come down unto you, having great wrath. Oh, he's mad. I tell you, the devil's mad. Good night. He's so mad. He hates God. He hates the Bible. He hates the blood of Jesus. He hates the church. He hates Christians. He hates prayer. He hates baptism. He hates the Lord's Supper. He hates missionaries. He hates evangelists. He hates pastors. I'm telling you, he's just full of wrath. He's so mad. Why? Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. I'm telling you, beloved, his number's about up. It's not going to be long. Jesus will split wide the eastern sky and descend down the staircase of the stars and say to a blood-bought church, Come up hither, my children. The king is coming. The king is coming. The devil is a short timer. Back in the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation, I don't turn there. Just trust me, I'll get it close to right. In Revelation chapter 5, we find one of the most interesting scenes in all the Word of God. Revelation 5 opens up with God sitting upon His throne. And in His right hand, He has, the King James Bible calls it a little book, but it's really a scroll. It's a scroll consisting of of seven pages, and each one of them sealed to the one before it. And they just roll it up and in that right hand of God is that little seven sealed scroll which is in effect the title deed to planet earth whoever ends up possessing that scroll is going to own planet earth lock stock and barrel and so there's God sitting with that scroll in his hand And the Bible says, And a great angel cried with a loud voice, Who is worthy to come and take the scroll out of the hand of him that sitteth upon the throne? Who is worthy? Now the question was not who's willing. Oh, there have been a lot of people who've been willing to own planet earth. Uh, Attila the Hun, he was willing to do it. 
Fidel Castro, he was willing to do it. Adolf Hitler, he was willing to do it. Khrushchev, he was willing to do it. And there are some clowns in Washington today. They're willing to do it. But the question is not is who is willing, but who is worthy. And none of them are worthy. And the Bible says in Revelation 5, and nobody moves. Who is worthy to come and take the scroll? Nobody moves. Nobody in heaven, nobody on earth, nobody under the earth. The Bible says nobody moves. John says in Revelation 5, and I began to weep. And that word weep there does not mean the trickle of a tear. Down the cheek, it's almost like buckets of tears. Great sorrow, grief, just crying and sobbing. Because you see there for a split second, the Apostle John wonders, is the devil forever going to have the power on planet earth? The book of 1 Corinthians says the devil is the god of this world. He and More people worship him than worship Jesus. Is planet earth forever going to be a place of drugs and prostitution and murder and rape and theft and hatred and bigotry is planet earth going to always be like that and he just weeps one of the elders of heaven says weep not John behold the lion of the tribe of Judah and John says I turned to see the lion and he said I saw a lamb as it had been slain. And I tell you, beloved, there is only one person in all of history. There is only one person in all of history who is both the lion and the lamb. And that's Jesus. And Jesus, in Revelation 5, you can read it when you get home, he steps up and he takes possession of that seven-sealed scroll. He takes possession of the title deed to planet earth. The book of Colossians says all things were made by him and for him. And one day he will step forth, and hey, you and I will be there to see it. He'll step forth, and he'll take that title deed, and there will be no more question about who's in charge here. And the Bible says when he does that, man, there erupts praise in heaven. All of the angels and all of the saints of God, and you and I will be part of that group if you're saved. The Bible says they begin to praise him. Glory and honor unto him that is worthy to be our Savior, the one who redeemed us to God by his blood. Unto him be glory and dominion and power and honor forever and ever and ever and ever. The devil is a short time. His number's about up. Jesus is soon coming. My hero is a preacher. Every preacher has their own heroes, but my hero was a North Carolinian by the name of Vance Havner. I wrote my Ph.D. dissertation on the preaching of Vance Havner. I named our first son Vance after Dr. Vance Havner. Dr. Havner was the hick from hickory, he called himself. North Carolina. Dr. Havner was an old man when I first met him as a teenage boy. He was already old. He was already a widower. His wife had already died. Dr. Havner was the most unusual preacher I've ever seen. He read every word he preached. I mean, he read every word of it. I wouldn't walk across the street to hear a preacher read a sermon. I'm just being honest with you. I, I don't like sermons that are read but Dr. Havner was so unusual and was so anointed by the spirit of God it didn't make any difference he was just unique Billy Graham did his funeral and at his funeral Billy Graham said most of us are born original and die copies but he said Vance Havner was born an original and he died an original nobody liked Vance Havner but he was so odd He never in his whole life drove a car. I mean, never. He never drove a car. 
He didn't get married till he was 39 years old. He said, I just don't believe in rushing into things. So he didn't get married till he was 39 years old. And he married a little Quaker woman named Sarah. And when she married him, she became his chauffeur. But until then, somebody had to come get him everywhere he went. And he would preach revivals and Bible conferences every week of his life, just about. Dr. Havner didn't have any hobbies. He didn't. He didn't hunt, he didn't fish, he didn't play golf, he, he didn't watch sports on TV, he could care less about that. The only diversion that he had, the only thing that he seemed to really like was he loved to read those old western shoot 'em up novels. Some of you have read those Zane Gray novels or those Louis L'Amour western novels. Well, Dr. Havner loved to read those western novels. And he said, I've heard him say it several times. He said, sometimes I'll, I'll get to the middle of the book. And he said, it'll just look like the hero's going down for sure this time. I mean, the Indians are about to scalp him, or the posse's about to shoot him, or the, or the crooks are about to lynch him. And it just looks so bad, Dr. Havner says, I don't see how he's going to get out of it this time. And he says, my stomach begins to churn, and I get so restless. He said, I can't stand it. He said, I go over and I read the last chapter in the book. He said, I read the last chapter and I find out that the hero, hey, he comes out on top again. And he said, I go back to the middle of the book and I say, find on, brother, find on, brother. It looks tough for you now, but I've read the last chapter. You're coming out on the winning side. <laughs> well, folks, I want to tell you, I've read the last chapter in this book and we're going to win. We're going to win. I have a preacher friend in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. He calls me, I guess, maybe once or twice a month. And sometimes he'll just call and he'll say, Bob, we're winning. Bye. And hang up the phone. <laughs> every time I see him, every time I talk to him, Brother Bob, we're winning. And I tell you, every time he does that, I get so excited I could attack hell with a water gun. I mean, it just, it just sets my shucks on fire. We are winning. Look at your neighbor right now and tell him, we're winning. Tell him right now, we're winning. We're winning. We're winning. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they say on MSNBC. I don't care what they say on Fox. I don't care what they say on whatever that other one is. I'm telling you, we're going to win because Jesus wins and we're with him. We win. Well, that's a message of encouragement. You ought to leave here tonight feeling better than you did when you came in. Because we have an enemy. Oh, yes, we do. It's the devil. He hates you. There's not a thing about you he likes. He doesn't think you're pretty. He doesn't think you're cute. He doesn't think you're masculine. He doesn't think you're strong. He doesn't think you're macho. He doesn't think you're tough. He hates you. Hates everything about you. Hates your mama. Hates your daddy. Hates your home. Hates you. I mean, he hates you. And he'll do everything he can do to ruin your life and leave you in a gutter. We have an enemy. But thank God, the one who is for us is greater than the one who is against us. The devil's a loser. He's a deceiver. He's an accuser. But thank God, he's a short timer. Soon, and very soon, we're going to see the king. You may be here tonight, and you may say, Brother Bob, you know, you preach that for me tonight. I don't ever really do that. I don't preach with a rifle. I preach with a shotgun. I like to hit as many as I can, all right? <laughs> I never single one person out and just pour it on them. No, no, I don't do that. I like to use as wide a load as I can. But sometimes a person will come in and they'll have a specific need and the Holy Spirit of God will drive right into their heart with truth. And you may, you may say, Brother Wild, you were preaching to me tonight. I really wasn't, but maybe the Holy Spirit was. Maybe you say, Brother Bob, the devil's been on my case. Brother Bob, every time I turn around, the devil, he just tries to knock me down and defeat me and he lies, he slanders me, he accuses me, he maligns me, he turns people against me, Brother Bob. Uh, the devil's just been on my case. Everywhere I go, the devil's just punching and punching away. 
Hey, you know what you learned tonight? You learned you can overcome him. Through the blood of Jesus, through the word of the testimony, and through your life totally surrendered. And it may just be that you need to make your way to this altar and say, Lord, tonight, I'm leaving this place a victor. I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I'm not going to believe that old junk of the devil anymore. I'm not going to be letting him put me down and beat me on top of the head. I am on the winning side. And Lord Jesus, I just want to come to this altar tonight and tell you thank you for saving me. Thank you for filling me with your spirit. Thank you for giving me a sure word. And I'm leaving this house tonight walking in victory. Hey, that would change your, that could put some of your homes back together. That could make a difference in your place at work. That could make a difference as you live as parents before your children. That could really change things at your house. And then you may be here tonight and you've never been saved. And the Holy Spirit has spoken to you. Hey, you're a loser. You're a loser, but you don't have to stay a loser. You don't have to stay. Brother Bob, has anybody ever told you to go to hell? Why, sure they have, but I'm not going. (laughs) I've made arrangements to miss. Hallelujah. And folks, nobody has to go to hell. You don't have to go to hell. If you're lost tonight, you don't have to stay lost. You see, one of the biggest lies the devil ever tells is what you are right now is what you're going to have to be forever. That's not true. That's not even true for a Christian. Hey, if you're a Christian tonight, you can start giving more than you've been given. You can start praying more than you've been praying. You can start attending more than you've been attending. You can start reading the Bible more than you've been reading the Bible. You can start sharing the gospel more than you've can been sharing the gospel. Hey, you don't have to be the same kind of Christian you've always been. You can be a better Christian. And if you're a lost person, you don't have to stay lost. And the devil says, oh, you're a drug addict, you'll be a drug addict all your life. You're a liar, you'll be a liar all your life. You're a, you're a sexual deviant, you'll be a sexual deviant all your life. I'm telling you, that's a lie. Jesus will change your life if you'll let him.